Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to talk about the Hoosiers. Welcome back to the Inside Indiana podcast. This is Editor-in-Chief Ken Bykoff along with publisher Ed McGoney. And Ed, we had some big news over the weekend with the announcement that Bobby Capobianco uh, has decided to transfer now that his sophomore year is over. Now, Ed, I don't think this really comes as a as a surprise to anybody considering, you know, Capo saw his uh, his role change and, and be reduced this year. Your thoughts on, on the decision and just how, uh, how this whole situation has played out. Well, uh, you know, he was in good academic standing, so it certainly isn't anything to do with, uh, you know, this is all above board. It's just a simple move for him to find some more playing time, which is going to be tough to come by. I mean, his minutes actually decreased from his freshman year to his sophomore year. And, you know, with Cody Zeller coming in, I don't think his minutes were going to go up that much. Plus, the 2012 class during his senior year includes Peter Jerkin and Hannah Perea. And it just didn't look like there was going to be room or playing time available for Bobby unless, you know, something really changed in the, in the, in the upcoming two seasons. And you know, hopefully he'll go somewhere and uh, catch on and, and get some more playing time and productivity. I mean, he was averaging less than two rebounds and two points a game last season. And, uh, you know, a 6'9", 235, 240-pound guy should be able to do more than that on a, on a team, especially a team that needed help up front like Indiana. So hopefully he'll find a, a new home and uh, be more productive and get more playing time. Yeah, you know, he's, he's a great kid. I mean, that was one of the things that uh, everybody really enjoyed talking to him. Uh, smart guy, somebody who, uh, who you know, really represented the program well. However, like you said, it is a playing time issue. And, you know, some people I have criticized Tom Crean a little bit about maybe not trying to push him a little bit harder or not uh, getting more out of him. To me, uh, Coach Crean, you know, pushes guys plenty hard. It's just a matter of them being able to respond. And, you know, I know that Bobby came into this past season expecting to get more of a chance to uh, to maybe use his athleticism a bit more, not be as, as much of an inside player. And I think that that could have played into that, uh, that uh, you know, lack of playing time as well if he was working on his game in one way and the plans of the coaching staff were had it, you know, kind of going a different direction than, than what he thought. And, you know, and, and just about the criticism that uh, that either, you know, people will badmouth Capobianco and say, well, the kid obviously couldn't handle it. So, you know, he'd fine, let him leave. And other people have said, you know, Coach Crean pushed him out uh, and, and accused him of that. What, what's your just take on, on, you know, kind of that dynamic? And is there any blame to be assigned here? I don't think there is. Um, you know, I just think it's a mutual decision on, you know, obviously IU needed to needed to uh, free up some scholarships and, you know, with, with uh, Bobby getting decreased playing time from his freshman to his sophomore year, I think he was one of the likely candidates to do it. And, you know, it's going to help him because he's going to get more playing time at a different school with a different situation. And it's going to help Indiana to free up some, some scholarship space for the 2012 class. In addition to that, you know, anyone who criticizes Kevin Bianco's work ethic or anything like that, I mean, he, the guy looks like he's sculpted from granite. I mean, he's obviously spent time in the weight room. He obviously, you know, improved his physical strength. It's not like he was just, you know, laying around on the couch in Bloomington eating cheeseburgers or something. And, uh, you know, obviously he was Tom Crean's first commitment in the 2000, um, 2009 class. So obviously Crean went after him and thought he was going to be a major part of this team moving forward. So I don't think it's Tom Crean, you know, um, just abandoning him. So certainly I think it's a, it's a mutual move. I don't think there's any blame to be assigned. I think Bobby worked hard. I think Tom Crean tried to coach him up. And, you know, some, you know, it just happened to be there were some guys there who earned playing time ahead of him. And that, you know, that's why he's, that's why he's moving on. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, you know, I, and, uh, you know, I mentioned the people who who will want to point fingers of blame and, so, you know, sometimes situation just doesn't work. I know that the coaching staff uh, sets expectations for players and wants them to meet them uh, and pushes them, tells them where they want them to improve. The players have to respond as well. But, you know, sometimes situations change uh, during the course of a, a four year career. And it is a matter of a thing of, you know, obviously Bobby thought that. His playing time was going to go down, like you said. Uh, said you know it was going to, and I think that you and I kind of 
uh, recognize maybe the writing on the wall with this thing when you got in later in the season and you had um, Jeff Howard getting playing time ahead of Capo Bianco in a couple of different situations and, you know, to where Capo had a lot of games where he got the, the old uh, hated uh, did not play coach's decision and, you know, again, that writing was on the wall, and we certainly wish him the best uh, wherever he might land. Now, the question for you, Ed, is now going forward, Indiana loses a guy that was at least a bigger body. Yeah, you t- they're getting Cody Zeller, but, you know, how does this affect what the team's going to be able to do next year? Well, from a depth standpoint, it certainly doesn't help matters at all. I mean, you're, you're losing a big guy, and you're adding one big guy. So I think you have to rely on, a, you know, on um, – more minutes from Christian Watford, probably at the power forward position. You really need Derek Elson to step up and play more significant minutes. You need Tom Pritchard to continue to uh, to play significant minutes. And, uh, you know, you just basically you're hoping that Cody Zeller will come in and give you 25 to 30 minutes a game. I mean, you're going to need that from him now with uh, less depth. You know, they originally anticipated having Kevin Bianco there as well in case foul trouble or injuries popped up. That's no longer available. And, uh, you know, you need you need Pritchard, Zeller, Elston and Watford to fill some significant minutes because uh, those are the only four uh, real big guys you've got. Do you think there's, this could be a situation where uh, maybe Ka- uh, Capel leaves, but there's a couple of other guys that might be looking the same, the same route? I know there's been a lot of speculation about a lot of different guys. You know, basically I've heard something about, you know, everybody. And it was just, uh, uh, you know, rumors along the way. But, I, you know... Do you think that that the that Capo Bianco is going to be the only guy that's that's going to be moving on? Well, if I mean it's a simple matter of numbers that if they're going to bring in five guys in 2012 and sign them, they can sign everyone in November because they can oversign by one. But before those kids set foot on campus, somebody's got to go uh, from the existing scholarship situation right now. And um, you know, obviously there's a there's a considerable stockpile of talent. In that wing position, the six four to six to six area, and they're bringing in uh, Jeremy Hollowell to add to that mix in 2012. They're bringing in Austin Etherington to add to that mix next season, and you already have Old Depot, Sheehy, uh, Maurice Creek. I mean, there's there's just so much talent there at the wing in the small forward position that you have to wonder if one of those guys isn't going to just say, hey, I see myself getting squeezed out of the rotation, and I'm going to go look for greener pastures some other school. I, that would be where I would think it would happen if it's going to happen. And it, it, it's in something one way or another, something's got to give before uh, the summer of 2012 when these five newcomers want to come into Bloomington. And maybe, maybe more than one guy will be, uh, you know, make an early exit. I don't know. But uh, you need at least one one more scholarship to sign and bring all five of those guys on campus. So something's got to give one way or another. Wanted to get your thoughts, too, on uh, this whole idea that's been kicked around about spring creening. A little play on Tom Crean's name about how every year you have a couple of uh, guys that uh, move on. And you know, the, my, my, at least my take on it is that, you know what, this happens at just about every, every big-time program. And, you know, you have guys that uh, aren't comfortable anymore who want to move on. Coach Knight certainly uh, did it during his long tenure at IU, and that, that it, you know, happens all the time. It happened under Calvin Sampson. It happened under Mike Davis. Guys where they just don't feel that they're a good fit anymore. Now, from a fairness standpoint, I just want to ask you about the, the whole idea of, of uh, you know, coaches, you know, and I'm not saying this is even what happened with Capo Bianco, but coaches pushing guys uh, out or suggesting that they go elsewhere. Uh, you know, just just your thoughts on kind of the fairness aspect of that. Well, I, I think it's I think it's a matter of a coach has to be honest with the player. If he doesn't see him factoring into the future of the program in a significant way, then it's probably best that, that he goes to the player and says, "Hey, you know, I don't see you getting more than five or six minutes a game." If, if that's not what your expectation is for the rest of your career, then you need to consider transferring. I mean, that's just that's good for everybody involved. I don't I don't think that's necessarily, you know, a, a, a horrible way to approach. I mean, honesty is, um, you know, the foremost, you know, the, the foremost um, import utmost importance for a coach with his players. I mean, if, if the player if the coach doesn't think the player is going to be able to cut it on in his current rotation. And he's not going to do any good for the team, and and he's not going to do any good for the player to stay there. 
then he may as well, you know, hit the road and and see if uh, see if he can find somewhere where it's, it works out better for him. I mean, I it's same thing happened with football, you know, in the off season. I mean, uh, people who didn't want to do what Coach Wilson was saying, or you know, they didn't want to put forth the effort. You know, maybe it's time for them to go as well. You know, I in some of the fifth year seniors said, hey, you know, I'm not going to torture myself and and uh, you know stick around here and and go through this for, you know, this rigorous training, and they moved on. I mean, you know, it, it happens. You know, it's, I don't think anyone's to blame or the Koreans necessarily forcing people out. I think you probably went to Bobby and said, hey, Bobby, you know, your minutes were decreasing last season. It's only going to get worse from here. Uh, you know, maybe you, want, maybe you should think about going somewhere else and get more playing time. And Bobby obviously decided that was the best move for him, and that's where he's going. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's that I, simple. Yeah, and I, I, I also had, you know, just think that it's uh, a thing to where rarely would a player be approached by this and be so, just shocked about it. I mean, like we said, the the writing was on the wall with him, and, uh, you know, and nobody, I, I really think, gets blindsided. And furthermore, it ends up working out uh, well in, in, you know, a lot of times. I mean, you could look at, you know, a lot of IU players over the years who decided to transfer. Uh, even under Crean, you think about uh, guys like uh, Nick Williams and Malik Story who've been uh, gone on and uh, been productive. And even in the past, I mean, uh, heck, you think back to a guy like Ben Allen, a guy like Joey Shaw, a guy like uh, uh, I think it's Chris Lawson uh, was a player, I think, who transferred to Vanderbilt years ago ended up uh, putting together a real nice career for himself. So, you know, from a fairness standpoint, uh, to, to me, you know, it's just it's just a part of the game, and everybody knows the equation going into it. Now, of course, Capo Bianco is going to be moving on, but there's a, a new commit for football, Kevin Wilson's first commit, uh, cornerback Dion Witte out of Pompano Beach, um, Florida, in Coral Springs High School. He comes on, um, on he's, like I said, the first commit. 5'10", 170 pounds. Kid had offers from Wisconsin, Minnesota, Central Florida, uh, Florida, and interest from a number of different schools, including names like Michigan, Nebraska, Miami of Florida, Florida. You know, Ed, your thoughts on on him being able to bring in, a, a, you know, what seems like a pretty decent commit, uh, considering that, uh, you know, Coach Wilson has yet to win a game at Indiana. Yeah, it's a good start. There's no question to the 2012 class. I mean, first of all, you're going into Florida, and you're getting – you know, some of that Florida Southern speed down there that um, IU has not really had that much success with bringing north. And that's certainly a good point, uh, Good, uh, a good move for Indiana. They need to add team speed, that's obvious. And they've always, they, you know, they've been lacking cornerbacks since Tracy Porter graduated. And really, that even when Tracy was here, they didn't have a great set of defensive backs. So any kind of defensive back talent they can add would be, is significant. And, uh, you know, seems like uh, the kid was pretty sought after. I, you know, I haven't spoken with him in person. I haven't seen him play. But uh, certainly based on the other teams that were looking at him and, and offering scholarships and recruiting him, they certainly think that he has a bright future. And now his future's with Indiana. That's, that's just good news for the Hoosiers. Yeah, and, you know, and it kind of validates the whole idea that I know Kevin Wilson isn't going to look at, at certain guys and say, you know what, uh, we're not going to have a shot at him. And, and not that, uh, you know, that Dion Witte is, is somebody who's being ranked among the elite in the country. Uh, you know, at, at this point, he's, he's, he's a solid cornerback. He's a nice addition. But, you know, just the fact that he is willing to go to Florida, he is willing to uh, to make that move down there. And Coach uh, Lynch did that a little bit, but, you know, it, it is a nice sign of what might be might be coming. And also, I think it's important, Ed, that the first commit comes on the defensive side of the ball, which is certainly an area that Indiana needs more work on the defensive side than anywhere else. Oh, yeah, there's no question about that. I mean, uh I think the offense is in good hands with Kevin Wilson being an offensive coordinator by trade, and he, you know, he also played offensive line for North Carolina, so obviously he knows all about the offensive side of the ball. But he obviously brought in coaches who understand what the importance of uh, secondary play is to the rest of the defense, and that's been an area that IU's been hurting for for season after season after season. They, they, they either the guys aren't quick enough to cover man to man, or they or they miss tackles, or you know, there's just been a lot of problems with IU secondary, a lot of turnover, a lot of changes, switching players in now because they couldn't find stability back there. And like you said also, Ken, I mean, uh, you know, just the fact that Kevin Wilson went down to Florida 
and 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 you know butted heads with uh, big name programs who usually Indiana just yields to on the recruiting trail. Is that that in in and of itself is big news for the Hoosiers that they're able to compete with uh, the Wisconsin's, the Nebraska's, you know those type of teams for a player. And you know, come away with them. I just think that's that's a positive. I mean, you know, if if you used to be that people used to criticize Bill Lynch because all the other scholarship offers his his players seemed to have, or most of his most of his commitments used to have, were Mac schools or or uh, you know smaller schools, not BCS type schools. Well, I used first commit this year had uh, three BCS offers, so that's that's a move a step in the right direction, in my opinion. Absolutely. Well, folks, that's all the time that we have for now. But before we leave, I uh, wanted to send our condolences out to the family of uh, former IU quarterback Dave Schnell, who passed away at the age of 44 over the weekend following a lengthy illness. Uh, you know, real quick, Ed, uh, you know, any thoughts that you have about uh, Schnell's passing? And, he, you know, he was a lot of people consider him the guy that just handed the ball off to Anthony Thompson. But he, he was a much better quarterback, I think, than people gave him credit for. Oh, absolutely, and uh, it's it's a, it's a real shame for him to to pass away at such a young age. I mean, it's um, it's it's tragic. I mean, he was what forty four years old, I think, yep. and uh, you know, yes, he had eighteen in the backfield with him, but uh, you know, his ability to throw the football certainly cleared uh, a few running lanes for AT as well. So, uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a, it's a real tragedy for the IU um, the IU family to, to lose Dave Schnell at such a young age. And that's all the time that we have for now. For Ed Magoni, this is Ken Bykoff. Thanks for listening and pace yourself.